We talked at some length about Aum Shinrikyo last year, when we released an episode on Shinji Aoyama's masterful take on trauma, Eureka. Today, we'll be examining the group once more, albeit from an entirely different perspective. If you would like to know specifics about their most notorious attack, we recommend you check out the earlier episode. We don't want to retread too much of the same ground here, but we recognize that we need to explain some basic information to save some of you from rewatching what remains our second longest episode to date. Suffice it to say for simplicity's sake that Aum Shinrikyo was part of a massive movement from the 60s onward, known as the New Religions, which could effectively be described as cults, typically melding pre-existing religious beliefs with the idolatry of a prime leader. Aum's leader, Shoko Asahara, was thought by followers of the faith to be the sole dispenser of divine knowledge within the world, who would lead the cult to salvation in spite of what they saw as a downward spiral of violence and decadence occurring in the world at large. Throughout the 80s and 90s, Aum committed kidnappings and murders which came to light largely after the jailing and trials of several prominent members following their largest attack. This incident, which occurred in March 1995, is known as the Tokyo Subway Sarin attack as it involved the release of the nerve gas sarin into the Tokyo Subway system. All told, the coordinated release of the gas resulted in 12 deaths and more than 4,000 injuries, with the death count likely being so low due to the diligence of subway employees and local doctors, as well as the incompetence of the all members involved in the attack. In our Eureka episode, and with that film, we examined Shinji Aoyama's interpretation of the aftermath of such an incident from the perspective of the survivors. We compared the experiences of the film's characters to the real-life accounts of those who witnessed the Tokyo subway attacks committed by Aum in 1995, as detailed in Haruki Murakami's non-fiction book Underground. This time, though, we're going to be examining this aftermath from the other side, that of the members of Aum who weren't jailed for their connections to the incident. There's not much necessary in the way of summary for these two films, A and A2, though their production history is as interesting as their contents. Besides, in some ways, their production history is their contents, so we might as well discuss both at the same time. If you're interested in viewing the films, they're both available on DVD in the US from Facets Video. We'll include the excerpts posted on Facets' YouTube page as well if you care to learn more without the aid of our voices. Today's episode is not designed to provide spoilers for either film, but simply to promote awareness of them and their importance. So there's no need to worry about spoilers, whether you've seen them or not. On that note, let's get into it. Both films were directed by Tatsuya Mori, who from 1979 until 1983 appeared in several films, among which were Sogo Ishii's short Shuffle, Kiyoshi Kurosawa's Kandagawa Pervert Wars, and Kazuhiko Hasegawa's The Man Who Stole the Sun, which, believe me, we're getting to that one someday soon. Throughout the latter part of the 80s, we can't seem to find much evidence of Mori's exploits. He reappeared in the early 90s with a variety of TV documentaries, a field of work he would continue in throughout the decade. In late 1995, Mori made an appeal to the head press with Aum Shinri Kyo, where he requested permission to film the goings-on of the group behind the scenes. Originally, the footage Mori gathered was intended to be used in a TV documentary, but once Mori learned that his employer meant to cut the footage up in a certain manner, he refused and became independent, completing the project on his own. Mori then spent two years following the group, chiefly Hiroshi Araki, the deputy spokesperson for Aum. He was granted unprecedented access to Aum's members, conducting interviews with them and filming their practices while swaths of other journalists were made to wait outside the group's various compounds. In 1998, the first film we're exploring today, A, was released. Much to Mori's chagrin, however, he faced difficulties in finding theaters to screen the film, not to mention the backlash he faced from moviegoers who accused him of sympathizing with Aum Shinri Kyo, who were viewed at this point as a domestic terrorist group. It is stated in the booklet included with Facet's release of the following film, A2, that Mori never intended to make a sequel. He wanted the first to act as its own project, and to stand on its own merits. However, after seeing what Mori thought to be disturbing changes in Japanese society from 1997 onward, namely what he saw as the overreaching reaction to Aum's attacks, he felt the need to continue following the group. 
With A2, Mori followed other members of the cult, with Araki only appearing in roughly one-third of the film. With a number of changes occurring in society, namely a set of laws targeting those still in Aum, Mori wanted to document how what remained of the group was treated by the Japanese populace and government. In this way, and in spite of the flack he caught for his first film, Mori states that A2 was a form of healthy dissension against the views and beliefs of the mainstream media and those who consumed it at the time. After A2 was released in 2001, Mori seemed to finally distance himself from the group. He didn't make another film until 10 years later, instead devoting a great deal of time to writing and publishing books. In 2010, before he even returned to feature documentary work, he published A3, a book covering what has happened to what is left of Alm in the years since the second film's release. I guess old habits die hard. We can't comment on the book as it's never been translated, and we literally only found out about it during the writing of this script. One day, we'll get around to looking into it and get back to you guys. Just, it, it might be a while. Don't, don't hold your breath. While Tatsuya Mori may have been slammed by the public at the time of their release, A and A2 remain today as a valuable record of this notorious cult's history. It's a history that, without projects like these, would be lost in favor of the narrative recorded by others, which, in and of itself, can teach us the importance of projects like these, which record controversial events as objectively as possible. A and A2 provide us some interesting perspective and lessons on a group that Mori says needed to be questioned. While members of Alm questioned their beliefs and place within the world, he says the public had made up their mind. 20 years after the release of the first film, with so much distance between the events depicted, this type of film is not only fascinating, it is immensely important for the historical record. In the process of researching this episode, we read the book Destroying the World to Save It by Robert J. Lifton, a notable chronicler of psychology, especially where it relates to catastrophe. Lipton had previously published books relating, among other things, to the fallout of the atomic bomb, to the Nazi doctors who performed inhumane experiments in concentration camps, and to the plight of American veterans of the Vietnam War. Given his field of research being psychology, the book acts not as a chronicle of Aum Shinrikyo's history so much as an analysis of the cult's beliefs and motivations in perpetrating the various crimes they did throughout the 80s and 90s. Lifton's book goes to great lengths to examine the psyche of Alms members, both before and after the Tokyo subway attacks. He compared the cultists' actions and beliefs to those of the members of the People's Temple, the Manson family, and Heaven's Gate, along with Timothy McVeigh, the primary perpetrator behind the Oklahoma City bombing, and the former Nazi doctors who Lifton interviewed for an earlier book. Through these comparisons, Lifton attempts to demonstrate that Alm is not a uniquely Japanese phenomenon, and that it would be foolish, perhaps even dangerous, to write them off as such. Mori's films, meanwhile, in their attempts to remain nonpartisan, provide no explanation for the events witnessed in their collective runtimes. It doesn't try to explore the reasons behind what the Alm members do, save as much as they care to explain in their own words. However, this stylistic choice does come at the detriment of anyone going into A and A2 without prior knowledge of Alm or their crimes. Sure, the two films offer a fascinating look into the lives of their subjects, but besides Araki, who we follow through most of the length of both films, no members are directly introduced. Instead, they're allowed to come and go as they did naturally during filming, with minimal post-production work being done to add context or explanations for the events. We observe some of Alm's practices time and again, like the use of the helmets you see here, which are said to help members receive the brainwaves of their guru, Shoko Asahara, or the repeated commentary on a set of new laws against subversion, which, as Lipton puts it, allowed the police to put under surveillance any group that has been involved in indiscriminate mass murder during the last 10 years. Thus, while we observe these practices and conversations without external information, we are left moderately in the dark. We're not sure if this is a shortcoming on the film's part, or a deft move to stop bias from entering the project. Either way, this causes the film to do what a good documentary ought to, in that it pushes the viewer to learn more, which is perhaps the point. However, as we see even in the first film, Tatsuya Mori is unable to entirely remain his status as neutral.
There's a scene in the first film in which we observe a protracted altercation between several police officers and several members of Alm. One of the officers continues to egg one of the cultists on, to the point that the cultist attempts to leave the area, at which point both of them collapse into a heap. The officers on the scene are seen claiming that the cultist was attempting to flee questioning, and that he is at fault for the officer's injuries. Breaking the fourth wall, director Tatsuya Mori moves from his unseen position behind the camera, where we have heard him ask his subjects any number of questions at this point, and for the first time we see him before the camera. Araki and his associates request that Mori provide them with a copy of the videotape, to help exonerate the cultist who has been arrested. Without this evidence, they say that he stands a near perfect chance of being found guilty of obstruction of justice, and facing jail time as a result. Initially, Mori is visibly reticent, saying that he cannot provide Alm with the tape, as this would introduce himself into his observation of their work and lives. It would be him taking a side, and his goal is to remain unbiased, to simply observe as he has up to this point. After further deliberation, however, Mori agrees to meet with the lawyer representing the arrested member, whom he provides with a copy of the tape. We then cut immediately to the member being released from lockup, explaining how the existence of the tape and Mori's willingness to turn it over saved him. It created a full record of the encounter with the police, where otherwise it would have simply boiled down to a debate between the word of a cultist and the word of multiple police officers. This sequence of events, perhaps better than any others, encapsulates the spirit of these two films more perfectly than we might hope to explain on our own. While Tatsuya Mori's aim through A and A2 is to present an unbiased view of Aum Shin Rikyo following the attacks in 1995, he tactically acknowledges that by virtue of simply committing these actions to film, then releasing them, he is inherently taking a side. The films exist not just as a record of Aum's activities in the latter half of the 1990s, but also as an examination of how observation of events can change their very course. Were Mori not there during the altercation, this member would have likely seen a proper sentence, rather than a simple arrest and detention time as he did. Were Mori's cameras not rolling behind the scenes where news media were held at bay outside the cult's various compounds, these standoffish confrontations observed between Araki and the reporters and the camera crews would be our sole sources of perception for this period of time. By turning the camera on those whose job it is to film, Mori is presenting us with both a humanized portrait of the Alm cultists still in the group after 1995, and providing a mirror to the Japanese news media, exposing those behind the camera the way they seek to expose their own subjects. All of these groups are presented as Mori's camera observes them. The camera is impartial, showing the news media encountered throughout the project who seek to do whatever they must to get a scoop. The students seen in the first film who openly ask some very hard-hitting questions of Araki when he is invited to have a roundtable discussion with their class. And the smaller subset of students who actively protest for the rights of the cultists as individuals rather than as a group. No narration is provided, with in fact very little information given on occurrences outside these characters' direct circles. We're never told who the members being put on trial at any given time are, nor what they have been charged with. This type of information is understood by the people we follow, so no one needs to explain it to them. Mori forgoes this type of explanation, perhaps to avoid rhetorical bias in how a potential narration might have been written. There is minimal editing to boot, with many sequences continuing uninterrupted, intercut with the interview sessions Mori conducts with individuals. Only three songs are employed in the first film, creating three distinct montages perhaps designed to elicit specific emotional reactions. These sequences aside, however, it truly feels as though Mori has done the most true duty he could as a documentarian in that he has not intruded on the actions of his subjects, but merely observed them. And perhaps this is why Araki, as deputy spokesperson of Alm at the time, agreed to let Mori film in the first place. With great swaths of reporters from any number of newspapers and television stations constantly on call outside, just waiting for any opportunity they could get to fast talk their way into the group's compounds, each of them looking for the scoop that they hoped to get before the others, Perhaps with this type of media circus going on, Mori's personal, unaffiliated offer of observing the group on their terms for a personal project, rather than for a news group, is the reason that Araki allowed these films to be made. 
With such an allowance, and in spite of their shortcomings in the explanation department, this pair of films provides a captivating portrait of a group in turmoil. We see, as Lifton confirms in his book through his own interviews, that there is a struggle that members of Alm and later Aleph go through in attempting to reconcile their divine leader, Shoko Asahara, with the egregious crimes he commanded his followers to carry out. They cannot fully separate the guru from the organization from their beliefs. Asahara's image is plastered on walls all over their compounds, his voice is listened to on personal headsets, and his brainwaves are supposedly transmitted through special Alm helmets. They speak of him cautiously when in public, either trying to save face by saying that they knew nothing of the crimes until they had been committed, a truth, it seems, for most members of Alm, or denouncing Asahara while begging others to understand that Alm is an inherently peaceful religion. In private, however, some members will speak candidly about how they would likely have answered the call had Asahara picked them to carry out similar violent acts. We see that upon release, Fumihiro Joyu, the publicity agent prior to Araki, who faced a minor jail sentence related to finances, seeks to rebrand the cult as Aleph. He wishes to forsake the name of Amshin Likyo and to shed all association with Asahara. Essentially, we see the beginning stages of Zhou Yu's attempt at a reformation for the group, where their core beliefs remain the same, but a stronger emphasis is placed on the peaceful beliefs of Aleph, rather than the apocalyptic portions of the cult's doctrine, which Asahara had culled from the Book of Revelation and the writings of Nostradamus. As you might imagine, however, with Tatsuya Mori and his small crew following the group for the better part of six years through such a period of upheaval, they meet quite a few cult members. And despite being members of the same group, these members are all individuals, with their own beliefs. True, Alm unifies them in their religious and spiritual beliefs, and guarantees that, at least for this period, they would face hardship from those protesting the group. However, we would argue that in showing the behind-the-scenes side of the group, Mori is exposing us to an uncomfortable truth, that these people are individuals, each with their own mind and thoughts. Part of their motivation and goal as members of Alm may be to effectively, quote, clone the guru, end quote, as Lifton puts it, becoming as like Asahara as they possibly can. But as we observe, reality is not so idealistic. In A2 especially, we spend a good bit of time with the members of one compound as they deal with the locals protesting outside their door daily, and eventually suffering eviction. We've seen or heard word of other protest groups at this point, concerned parents, nationalists, all of whom rashly rail against the group through signs posted outside their compounds, or through marches, or through confrontations with the police who are stationed outside Zhou Yu's residence when he is released from prison. But this group is different. They're locals who reside by the compound, and they've been doing this for a long time now, rather than simply a day or a week. This, as we see, complicates the dynamic for both sides. The Alm members who live in the compound offer the locals reading material written by, or at least attributed to, Asahara. The locals don't turn it down as one might expect, but instead offer food or secular books to the members. The cultists must turn down the food due to their practices of asceticism, or the abstinence from worldly pleasures. But as we see, one of the young men actually takes the books and returns some he borrowed previously. What's more, when the locals staked out decide to pack it in and leave, the cultists actually help them break down their tent. What's even more is that when the cultists later get evicted, the locals show up to bid them a tearful farewell. Mori, by simply showing these scenes in sequence, expresses a side of the Alm protester dynamic that is not often, if ever, presented in the mainstream media. These people have spent so much time together that they have legitimately grown fond of one another. The locals still say that the beliefs of Alm are wrong, or incomprehensible, but they accept the members as people rather than members of a larger whole. This feeds into the theme discussed earlier concerning how much of a story we are shown in any given instance. We are presented with a whole new paradigm through A and A2, and we are asked to reconcile these two facts that these people belong to the group who perpetrated these heinous crimes, and that they are, in fact, people. 
It's a tough pill to swallow and a sentiment reflected by Lifton in the afterword of his book, but we believe that this is the main point of these films. Mori seems to say that we must ask more questions than we can easily answer in the face of devastation, and through the answers we find, we must draw our own conclusions.